So for the first time for this week and the last time for this Fusil, we'll be listening to our speaker. Is there anybody here who you do not know the evangelist? You do not know him. All right. So we're all familiar with him. He's our district pastor and he will be bringing the word of God to us. It's the wonderful words of life. And he has been doing a good job, right? Amen. He has been proclaiming the word of God. I missed a few nights, but I know that it was good because I watched the streaming. All right, so he's going to come and present us tonight. Before he comes, the church choir, you're going to sing for us. And then we'll have our theme song. Pray for our pastor, please, as he comes. A part of the choir will be singing for us.
Amen. Uh, it took us a while to get here, but we are happy in the Lord. I am convinced that the word of God is where it's at. <laughs> yeah, if you're not standing on the word, I don't know where you're standing. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what gets you excited or what turns you on and elevates your soul and lift you up, but when it comes on to the word, I, I get absolutely overwhelmed and excited with the word. I am... I'm a preacher that tend to get so excited over the word of God. I spend most of my try time when I am dealing with the word. Most of my mind power and my energy is spent trying to just calm myself. <laughs> not to get me over. And um, I try not to hold the mic in my hand. Probably we should have everybody here. <laughs> The atmosphere was just surcharged and there was so much of the Holy Spirit and so much of life and vigor. And in the early morning, we were alone at the beach and uh, I tell you, the, the pristine blue water, clear as crystal, calm with just gentle ripples coming through. The beach so clean, the sand is so pretty. I, I don't think I've seen that beach so pretty in my life. I don't know, it looked like the Lord was preparing it for us and we didn't know. <laughs> but but, but it, it, it was a good time. Amen? Amen. I left there and I went and did some chopping of bush. Use my cutlass, you understand? Yeah, chop. I chop some bush somewhere. Yeah. Let off a little steam, you know. And then, of course, I was at Dover. Beautiful um, Thanksgiving service. Isn't that right? Those of you who are at Dover, good service, eh? Amen. And, and we had a good word. <laughs> a good word at the sanctuary. What a word at the sanctuary. I don't know. I, I just thought I would give them a word at the sanctuary. And I tell you, Pastor Mighty was there, Pastor Hutton. We had such a wonderful time. Pastor Mighty came to me in the vestry and he said, Clark, I can't understand you. We will get that word at the sanctuary. I never see them things in the sanctuary in my life. <laughs> so he said, man, you think I can use this stuff? I said, use this stuff, man. It's good stuff. Sanctuary is good stuff. Isn't that right? Probably one day we should look at the sanctuary, but um, I don't know if we're going to have time for that, but maybe one day we should. I, at another church in another era, I did something on the sanctuary. I did a four-week crusade on the sanctuary where we preach on nothing else but the sanctuary every night. We preach for six nights, every night for four weeks on the sanctuary. And after that, I realized we still didn't get too far in the sanctuary, but we were really sweet. I did another series on the Sanctuary at Roseville with the guys for a couple of weeks, using a different set of messages from a different standpoint. And I've con come to the conclusion that the Sanctuary message is just too vast. Too vast, too large. There's just too much in it to attempt to do Sanctuary series. So I don't know if I'm going to attempt that again. The good news tonight is that we are having a baptism. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is good because we have one or two uh, young persons who are determined to commit themselves to the Lord. Uh, amen? amen? Yeah, the best time to come to the Lord is when you're young. The younger, the better, and the better, the younger. Amen. One of my favorite texts is children are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb there is his reward. But since we have in baptism, I thought we would talk a little bit on the new birth baptism. As for a few minutes, I hope. Uh, turn your Bibles with me to St. John chapter 3.
Let's read together the Nicodemus story. I apologize at the beginning, like I do with most of these sermons, because I will not be able to give you a detailed exposition of Nicodemus. Um, but from time to time, we might touch on it. I'm going to touch on one or two aspects of it. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, who said and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, early I say unto thee, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you receive, not our witness. If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heaven? And after these things, so much material, so much in so little space. I love the Lord Jesus. As we do every night, we take our title for our subject um, out of the text, and we want to take it right out of the mouth of the Lord. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, here's what we are going to use for our subject from verse 5. Born of the water and of the spirit. How about that, brethren? You want us to talk about that while we have the baptism of these children and... Um, Others are, we're going to baptize. Um, born of the water and of the spirit. Amen. In doing that, we have just circumscribed our text. But since we have some children to be baptized, we might as well give them a little of the story. That the story is sweet in its simplicity. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. It is very arresting to take up the Gospels and to read them. The Gospel of John deals with truths that neither Matthew, Mark, nor Luke dare touch. For that reason, theologians and scholars has for centuries designated the Gospel of John as the Gospel of Mysteries. It is here. The one man, can you imagine it? That such a thing as important as the new birth and Jesus mentioned it just once in his earthly ministry and Jesus spoke to one man, Nicodemus. The Bible tells us very clear that there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And in saying that, we have learned something about Nicodemus. First of all, we learn that he's a Pharisee. Pharisee.
Pharisee. You ask, what's that? Well, when we talk about Pharisees, we are talking about it's really just conviction. They work together, they form the Sanhedrin, but their beliefs deep down were opposites. The, the Pharisees were spiritual. They were ritualistic. They believed in the supernatural. The Sanhedrin and the opposite were the opposites. They were naturalists. They didn't believe in a lot of scripture. In fact, they believed some scripture, but they refused to believe the essence of the Bible. They didn't believe in the angels. Sadducees didn't believe in the angels. Pharisees believed in the angels. Pharisees said, we believe in the angels. Angels exist and they appear to men. And the angels of God encamp around the saints. The Pharisees said, the Sadducees said, you guys are crazy. There is no such thing as the angel. We only believe what we can see. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees said, no, you should eat and drink because when you're dead, that's it. Of course, the Sadducees were for the greater part, almost all of them. In fact, I've never heard of a Pharisee who was not extremely rich. All Sadducees were, were Pharisees were rich, but the Sadducees were fabulously rich. Every single one of them were billionaires. No wonder they didn't want to believe in some things. They have so much money. All they wanted to know is live up this life with their money. But Pharisees were rotten rich also. They were, they were several extremely rich Pharisees. But the Pharisees believe in the Bible, they believe in the resurrection, they believe in the Holy Ghost, they believe in prayer, they believe in righteousness, they believe in scripture. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. In fact, Pharisees believe scripture so much that many of them are like Seventh-day Adventists today. Many of them go to the extreme when it comes down to practicing their religion. A lot of the Pharisees were extremists. And so, within their ranks, there were different types of Pharisees going to extremes in their religious practices and modalities. My wife, my girlfriend, yeah, we were not married then. It was just my girlfriend. But I'm... Um, we were at school together, you understand. And um, one day she came to me and she said, I just study a lot, do some research on the Pharisee up in the library and I want to share with you what I learned. And I said, all right, share it with me. I'm, I'm interested in that. She said, you never really researched the Pharisee. I said, no. She said, what? She said, you must research the Pharisee. You learn a lot of things. I said, well, you know, I never really uh, have any interest in the man who is too far to see. <laughs> But she said, I want to tell you what I learned about the Pharisee. And, and I said, what do you learn? And she was so excited. I've never seen her excited like that over some religious subjects. So, you know, I'm giving her the, the day, even though I'm not too interested in the Pharisees. And <laughs> but she's telling me, and I never forget what she said. I've never researched it from that. And I just remember what she said. She said to me, ah, there are seven different types of Pharisees. I said, what? I didn't know that. But, you know, I'm not too interested with her. There are seven. There are 70. But, but I'm giving her because, you know, you have your girlfriend. You have to kind of listen. You understand? Let me tell you something about women. Even when you're not interested, listen. I make them think you listen. Do not, mm hmm yeah, mm hmm And then get excited now and then, yeah. <laughs> and you really, I, 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 and the girlfriend will become your wife. If you do the opposite, you will still be free, single, and disengaged. <laughs> So I'm listening. You understand? I have enough sense to listen. I already know that I'm kicking my mind. And she's telling me seven types of Pharisee. And I said, tell me about them. And she began to tell me. She said, one of them is the bleeding Pharisee. The bleeding Pharisee. I said, what kind of bleeding? You mean like blood? She said, yes. Bleeding Pharisee. Blood all over his face and his skin. He bleeds a lot and frequently. And I, I, I begin to perk up because I want to know why is he bleeding? And she said, I'll tell you why. She said, this Pharisee decided that he would never look upon a woman to lust after her. He, he has made a covenant with his eyes. 
that he wouldn't lose. Tell you the truth, me never really make the covenant with my eye not to lust or anything, but the Pharisee did that. <laughs> and, and the Jews were peculiar when it comes on to their women, and they still are incidentally in the East. And they decided that the woman must cover her head. Especially if she's not. Cover your head! Any woman whose head is not covered was considered loose. That, that, that's how it was in the East. We have no such custom in the West. But in the East, they had this custom that the woman must cover her head and, and that prevent the men from lusting. You understand? I mean, if a woman cover her head, it's hard for you lusters to get in gear. <laughs> because the covering of the head, I, I was talking to some friends from the Pentecostal church and they were telling me that we, our women must cover their head. And I asked why and what. And they said, yeah, they must wear a hat. Because they thought it's hat they used to cover their head. So they figure if the woman have a hat on her head, then the head is covered. And I have to let them know, that's not what the Bible mentioned to when it talks about covering the head. That's not even what the Jews believe or the Muslims or any of the Eastern people. I said, what they cover is not the hair, but the head. I said, the head is the entire thing. <laughs> and so I said, when they cover the head, they wear a veil and or a shawl. And it comes down below the chin in the face. It must fall before your face to your chin. Then it must reach back over your shoulder and goes back way down in most cases to your ankles at the back. So that the entire head is covered and the hair to everything that is on your head. So if you can see a woman here any at all, even uh, 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 she's not covered. But more than the hair, it's not the hair that they're interested in. They are interested in the face. They believe you should never look upon a woman's face because the woman's so pretty that if you see her face, you're going lost. So, yes, elders. So you have to cover the face. And of course, the only thing they leave out is a place so that you can, the eyes of the woman you can see. But well, you shouldn't see her face. Because once you see your face, you see how pretty the girl is and you're gone. <laughs> so they cover the head so that you don't see the face. But sometimes, even in Israel, there would be some women. We are look, man. <laughs> so they would. Unveil the face so you can see the face. So the woman would be coming down and she has sure her face, you know, so you see how nice she is and she has a smile. Now, if the Pharisee is walking, the bleeding Pharisee, and he sees a woman who with face uncovered, with head uncovered, so the veil is over there covering the ear, but he can see the face. Immediately from the tiny seat, as he realized it's a pretty woman, he would shut his eyes tight. Because in can't look upon a woman. Because the moment you see a woman's face, you know you're gone, right? So he shut his eyes tight. The believing Pharisee. And he would begin to walk fast to pass this lewd woman who, who, who is showing her face. Because surely she must be a prostitute or something to show her face. No decent woman would show her face. And, and so he shut his eyes tight. I said, this woman now nah, go catch me today. And he begins to walk fast. And oftentimes, he would hit up in trees. And then the blood would gush because he's going so fast. Scrape himself in walls and the blood would gush. And it was pure all over the place. He's called the bleeding Pharisee. But even though he's bleeding, he's still not opening his eyes. He's making sure he pass the profligate woman first before he opens his eyes. Determined that he would never Look on a woman to lust after her. I can tell you about one or two of the Pharisees. You can learn about them. Then there was the hunchback Pharisee. The what? Yeah, that's the Pharisee who has decided that the way to, to holiness is to be always and constantly in prayer. He prays without ceasing. And even while he's walking, he has his scroll by his side, and he's down in prayer, and his back is hunt. And he's taking him time to walk and pray. So sanctimonious that he does it for so long until his body became bent and hunch over the hunchback. And when you see him, you know he's a man of God, right? Because he has perfected what is called the holy walk. 
You know, in, in, in Christianity, you have all, in, in religious circles, you have all kinds of frauds that exist. You have holy walk, you have holy talk. <laughs> you, you, you have holy everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, holy kiss, you have holy dress. You have, you have all kinds of things that people put on to make you think that they are more righteous than everybody. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. But he was not just a normal Pharisee because Jesus said, the text said, a ruler of the Jews. That means by any stretch of the imagination that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, the highest authority in Israel. Nicodemus was a ruler. He was one of the men that made decisions for the entire nation. Way up there. But not only that, but in the course of the conversation, Jesus said something about him that, that you will understand later on. Jesus, in speaking to him, said, Art thou the master, art the teacher in Israel, and know it not these things? So he was not just a Pharisee. He was not just sitting on the Sanhedrin council. But he was a master teacher in Israel. The school in Israel at the time, when the book was written, was the school of Gamaliel. There were two schools in Israel. There were the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. The school of Hillel and Gamaliel as the professor. But the school of Gamaliel at this time had different professors. And then underneath, the, above those professors were other professors. And finally, at the top controlling the school as the ultimate theologians was the master, the teacher in Israel. And Nicodemus was the teacher in Israel. It was the school that Saul of Tarsus attended. And at that school, the ultimate professor, Emeritus, was Nicodemus. He was the one that was teaching the others, Pharisees and the other theologians and all the, the great ones in Israel. Everybody looked to Nicodemus for instruction. This is the man that Jesus said, you must be born again. But there is something else about Nicodemus that I would like to share with you because when I read uh, Nicodemus from Sister White, Sister White said all kinds of things. Uh, sorry, to have to quote enough Sister White to you, but you, you, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You don't read much Sister White. No one day you come out here to hear from me. <laughs> Just Sister White, there, give you. For those of you who don't like Sister White. Sister White said something that is fascinating about Nicodemus that, that, that absolutely blew my mind. She said that there were three men in the life of Christ, in the times of Christ, three men in Bible times, Whose character nearly represents the character of Jesus. Upright, impeccable. And when it comes to law, these men stand firm. She said, apart from Jesus, these men were the most nearly reflecting the character of God on earth. Impeccable when it comes to law. And she names them. The first, she said, is Nicodemus. The second one, Saul of Tarsus. And the third one, the rich young ruler. These were men who were impeccable when it comes to law. These were men whose life was clean and the slate seemed to be so great and so sweet and so nice. Nicodemus stand there. A man whose character was above and beyond reproach. A man who was in the church and who was living better than anybody else that Jesus met. Apart from the rich young ruler. And Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said to him, you must be born again. When I read that, I got a little nervous because I begin to wonder, why is it that Jesus didn't say this to anybody else? Jesus run with cursing sailors. Jesus was, was talking to, to, to adulterers, uh, women caught in adultery, and prostitutes, and, and Jesus had the worst of sinners. There were publicans everywhere who were extortioners and thieves that 
Jesus had around him. And Jesus never said to one of those dirty, no good, worthless rascals, you must be born again. But Jesus looked at Nicodemus, whose life was impeccable, whose religion was flawless. Nicodemus, who knows the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, who could quote entire passages of scripture. Nicodemus, who taught in church and whose life was so sweet, Jesus looked at him and said, you must be born again. Why tell a man like that, something like that? No wonder Nicodemus retorted and, and began to argue with Jesus. And me, born again, me, 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 me. I wondered at first as to why Jesus would look at the best man that he can find in the church and in the nation to tell that he must be born again. And I came to the conclusion that Jesus did that in order for all of us to realize that the best that humanity has to offer cannot enter God's kingdom. That man's best is still not enough. There are those of us who come out here night after night and who, when we hear the word of God preach, the first thing we say, I am as good as any Christian. Why? I even live better than them who Jesus have. Well, that can't help you. You must be born again. Mm. There are other things that seems incidental about Nicodemus that I could say. I'm not going to go into all of them. We could talk about his wealth. Because I am told that Nicodemus was one of the wealthiest men in Israel. That Nicodemus, it is said, I read it, that Nicodemus could feed every man, woman, and child in Jerusalem for 10 years. And it is estimated conservatively that it would take at least a billion dollars a year to feed them. Nicodemus was a multi-billionaire. And yet Jesus looked at him and said, you must be born again. Education can't save you. Clean life can't save you. <laughs> Money can't save you. Position can't save you. No matter how high you get, you need to realize that when it comes to Jesus, you must be born again. But there is something about Nicodemus that the very division of the Bible into chapters and verses might, might have you miss. I, I'm just going to give this as the last one because I don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to go to my real subject. But since I'm talking about Nicodemus, I think I might show this in for good measure. Is that all right? Chapter 2, verse 23. Let's read together. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jew. Did you get it? Jesus was at Jerusalem at the Passover, at the feast day. And while he was there, <coughs> he was teaching and he was healing people. He was working miracles. And the Bible said when he did that, many people believe on him when they saw the miracles he did. So when they look and see what Jesus was doing, they run to him and said, Jesus, we believe in you. You are the son of God. We trust you, Lord. You are our type of man. But the Bible said, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. It's not every believer that Jesus trusts. They come and they talk all kinds of things, professing to be good Christians, professing to be members of the church, professing to love the word of God. But Jesus could look through those hypocrites and he said, I know trust you. <laughs> I know no sort of believe in God, but God no trust you. He did not commit himself to them. And, and the Bible tells you why. The reason for that is because he knew all men and needed not 
that any should testify. Look at that word. Should testify of man. The thing I love about Jesus is that Jesus reads the heart himself. And many people come to me sometimes to write out recommendation and to testify about their character and what have you. Jesus did not have any need that anybody should carry anybody here because he knew all men and he knew what was in man. And so Jesus said, don't ask Peter, James, and John to, to introduce you to me. I know what is in your heart. I don't trust any of you. But there was a man of the Pharisee, and that's why the Nicodemus story is there. There was a man who was there that Jesus could trust. There was a man there that Jesus knew he could commit himself to. There was this man of the Pharisee, this Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a trustworthy man. He was such a man that Jesus knew, you know, I can't trust Nico. I can't trust any of you. But Nicodemus, Ellen White said, was there watching Jesus from the periphery. He didn't come close. He didn't talk to him. He was just observing and meditating and taking in the word. And Jesus said, I can't trust any of you who come forward, but that man over there in the corner, I can't trust him. And I'm going to deal with him later. I'm not going to come now in the crowd, but he's coming again. Then Jesus said to him a little later, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. What is that? That's what I'm going to talk on and, and we, we, we have the baptism. What is water and the spirit? Except a man be born of water and of the spirit. Verse 5. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. The baptism of water. Nicodemus knew what that was. Because before Jesus' time, there was another preacher. John. And in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, John was careful to tell the people. <coughs> when they come to John to be baptized, John tell them that I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Every time they come to John, John would repeat the same thing. And when you read the different Gospels, you get shades of differences in it. But the, the concept, the idea, the thought content is the same. John said to them, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But one is coming after me, who is preferred before me, who is before me even though he's after to me. When he is shoes, I am not latched of whose shoes. I am not worthy to unlatch. But he shall baptize you when the Holy Ghost. And sometimes John would add something to them. That is fan is in his hand and he shall thoroughly purge his floor. He said, I baptize you with water and to repentance. But though I'm baptizing you, let me tell you, you still have some things now you will need purging. But the man who is coming after me, he has his fan in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. When him clean you up, you're totally clean. He shall baptize you again. But this time it's with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Every time they came to John, John would repeat the same thing over and over and over again. John would talk about the baptism of water and he would talk about the baptism of the spirit, the baptism of water and the baptism of fire. He would say to them, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I want you to get something because those of you who is going to be baptized and those of you who are baptized already and have no clue what you do. Hear me now. The baptism of water. What is that? The baptism of water, John tells us, is the symbol of repentance. Is the what? John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. The baptism of water is the symbol of repentance. It is the human condition necessary for the transformation of your life. It is the what? Human condition necessary. Say after me. It is the human condition necessary for the transformation of the life. Let's try it again. The baptism of water. Say it after me. The baptism of water is a, the symbol, a symbol of repentance. 
Parker, you should say this symbol. Let's do it over. Because we want this symbol instead of ah, because that might make you think we have more symbols of repentance. The baptism of water, baptism of water. is the symbol of repentance. It is the human condition necessary for the new birth experience. In order for you to be born again and transformed, there is something man must do and there is something God must do. Let me repeat this. There is something man must do because God can do it for you. And there is something God has to do because you can't do it for yourself. <laughs> you want me to get it again because I want this to sink in. In order for you to be born again and to be transformed, you Christians and you people who don't even understand what you did, there are two segments to it. There are two baptisms. There are two times that you must be baptized. One, you must be touched by man and you must be touched by God. John said, I am a man, so I can do man part. Yes. Baptize you unto repentance, because that is man part. And when you go in the water, that is a symbol of repentance. It is a symbol of what? Repentance. No, we need to uh, go a little slow. Repentance. What is repentance? I'm going to tell you what it is by telling you what it is not. Repentance is not confession. Touch somebody beside you and tell him, repentance is not confession. When I was in Mobi, two of my neighbors get to quarrel. One of them was a thief. The other one can curse hard. So the sister who can curse hard, and the thief in brother catch a quarrel. My mother house on top of the hill. I can't tell you because him dead now. As all thief always end up. But they catch a quarrel. I never forget it. I was on my veranda looking out at the situation. You understand? And Miss G. The two of them start cuss. And when Miss G are cuss, you know, Miss G cuss. Listen to me. Do a mess with Miss G. If Miss G ever curse you, you think BLM can curse? Who Miss G curse is cursed. <laughs> Especially when you see Miss G get serious and take off her clothes and strip naked. When Miss G come down to birthday suit, are ready? She ready for you? Run! You can't manage it. Your sophisticated thing that you learn from college. All of your sophisticated terminology and your jejun garquility and your asinine affections cannot help you. <laughs> Miss Jackie, you're the raw, low, dumb, rotten, dirty part where we come from. We are down the sock. <laughs> so they get to curse. And when Miss G start cursing, Cluffy. Cluffy couldn't take it. So Cluffy run in my house. Grab out him M16. Rush, come back out and all of you watch. Of course, him can't shoot Miss G. Can't wait we live there. But him come out. Wally going out of the air. When Miss G tell him, say, you're a worthless thief. I sit and him couldn't manage it. Him shout out. With him going out of the air. He said, me a thief, me a thief, me a thief. So I'm me a thief. And he started. Man, about 10 times in talk, say my thief. You know what? Claffy confess, say my thief. But him never repent. <laughs> He's still a thief. When you confess, it doesn't mean that you repent. Let me repeat this. Because there are some people. Let, let's try it again. Let, let's try it again. Can you need to understand it. To confess means to admit. But to repent means to quit. 
Amen. So you don't repent until you're happy. As long as you are doing it, you don't repent yet. In order to be baptized with John baptism, you must repent. Because John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. You quit. Things I used to do, I do them no more. Places I used to go, I go there no more. I quit. You're ready for repent. The moment I say, all right, Lord, I quit. You're ready for baptize. The baptism of water then is the symbol of repentance. The baptism of the Spirit. You hear this one now? Because Jesus said, you must be born of water and of the what? The new matter, the Spirit. You must be born of the water. Except a man be born of water and Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The baptism of water is the symbol of repentance. The baptism of the Spirit. Hear me now. Is the divine answer to the fulfillment of the human condition. It is the what? <laughs> Once man do his part and repent, quit, God will answer. God will respond. Once you do your part, God ready. God say, in quit, so it's time for the spirit come in. The baptism of the spirit. Listen to me now. Man can repent. Yes, he can stop. But man cannot regenerate or transform his own heart or life. So the, when the man repent, God respond by baptizing with the spirit. The baptism of the spirit. Let, let me let me repeat after me. The baptism of the Spirit is the divine answer to the fulfillment of the human condition. When man repent, God regenerates or transforms or creates in him a clean heart and a new spirit. Man cannot Change is not God is the only one who can take away the stony heart out of the flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Will you say amen out there? Somebody said to me tonight, Pastor, my heart a rock. Well, thank God for that. You recognize it? No God can work by you. Because the Lord said, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Will you say amen out there? And if you are to go to heaven, you have to repent and get the water. But you need the spirit to totally regenerate or transform your life. Amen? amen. Tonight! We have some people who are ready. Them ready for the water. And I want to tell you, brethren, as sure as there is a God in heaven, if they, as sure as they repent, as sure as they give up, quit, God is going to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. He is going to regenerate, transform the spirit of man. Only a God can do that. And in order for you to enter heaven, you need both of them. You need the water and you need the spirit. You need both of them, the baptism of water, but you need the baptism of the spirit. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born of water, that's what John is doing. And of the spirit, that's what John said the man who come after him is going to do. Except you get John's stuff and the stuff of the man who come after John, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Salvation. Salvation is offered tonight. I'm going to close with an appeal because I have a baptism. But it's good for you to understand what the baptism is all about. The baptism of water is man part. So God get a man to baptize you with water because that's man business. 
So the pastor enter into the water with you and baptize you with water unto repentance. But for you to get the second part, you have to truly repent. You can't be a confessing person who only a confess but not stop. You have to make up your mind that now, Lord, I don't with that life there. Lord, I'm turning over a new leaf, new page. I am starting all over again. Will you say amen out there? And God will transform your life. He will baptize you with the Spirit. John said, when he comes, when Jesus comes, that he will transform his fanners in his hand. And he will thoroughly cleanse his floor. You say, Pastor, I'm here to be baptized, but some things still are bad at me. No worry. I got a Jesus part. You can't manage it. You say, Pastor, I'm here to be baptized. But boy, I see some dirt still in my life. Lord, what am I going to do? I say, don't worry about that. God will take care of it. <laughs> he knows how to do it. His fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge the floor. He will clean up your life. Jesus will transform you in such a way that even you will be shocked at what God will do for you if you will stick to the Lord and you stick to him in prayer and you keep on with Jesus. He will clean you up. Change in your heart. The spirit of God. What water can take care of, the spirit will take care of it. Will you say amen out there? The fire will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There will be a burning in your heart and a fire in your soul and a joy in your spirit. And there will be something down inside of you telling you this is the way. Walk in it. There will be a guide in your life like fire. Purging you. Cleaning you. That's what baptism is about. That's what it's all about. And I come here to tell you Nothing in life is more important than obeying God. You're here tonight. You want to say, Pastor, I need this transformation in my life. Please stand. If that is you, I'm going to invite you to come to the altar and I'm going to pray for you. Salvation. Salvation is offered tonight. Nicodemus clean living, but him still need transformation. Clean life, but still need Jesus. Big shot in church, but still need God. At the very zenith of the aristocracy of the ecclesia, still must be born again. What a mighty God we serve. The thing I love about God is that he can do it. What you have been attempting to do for years to clean up your own life, God can do it in a jiffy. The reason why you have not been successful in cleaning up your life is because that's not your job. You're taking on God's job. Your job is to repent. Why you don't just repent, man, and let Jesus work? Let go and let God work. Stop this righteousness by works and trying to work your way into the kingdom of God. It has never worked and it can't work. Heaven is reached by being born into it. If you're not born into heaven, you can't go to heaven. It's not like America where you can naturalize. You go over there, you just take out your green card. Heaven is not reached by green card. Everybody who go to heaven have to be born from above. That's what he said to Nicodemus first. You must be born from above. I know ten from a high place. Must be born. That's how it works. And we come here tonight to tell you that the water and the spirit must work together. That's how heaven is reached by water and by spirit. Some of us have water but no spirit. You can't go nowhere. Because you don't have man thing. You still are going with man thing. You have not crossed over to the divine yet. You, you, you have not yet committed the way to God yet. You have not yet been touched by the mystery of Christ yet. No wonder when, when John later on saw some disciples, when Paul saw some disciples who were, who were baptized by John baptism and who never hear about the Holy Spirit. He said, man, we have to baptize you again. He said, Lord, you never get it. You never get it. You have walk on one wheel. You have fly up on one wing. You're not straight. You're not straight, man. You're not straight. 
Every time you try, you just a twist around. Just a flutter. You can't go nowhere and drop boof. Can't fly or one wing. You need the spirit of God to work in your life. Bow your heads where you are. Eternal God and our Father, what a message. What a last night message. What a message. Oh Lord, help us, Lord. Help us to reach out and grasp salvation as it's presented clearly before us tonight. Lord, I present before you those who came to the altar. Some of them have never been baptized. First time, some are going in the water tonight. Some of these children and others going in the water tonight. Some, Lord, are here, sinners, and at the altar for the first time, recognizing that they need this divine transformation. Like Nicodemus, some are confused. But we thank you for the truth. Verily, verily, truly, truly, verily, verily. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, some of us have been in the church for years, but we have not yet grasped the essence of salvation. Help us tonight as we come to this altar. In the name of Jesus, we plead this baptism of the Holy Ghost. As we have received the water, Lord, give us freely of your Holy Spirit tonight. Help us, Lord. I present those who are about to go in the water with me. I ask, Lord, that you will give them this new life, this new experience, that you will release in their life the power of the Holy Ghost, the transformation that only God can bring about. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word, making it so clear, so simple. Tonight, we present to you, Lord, these at the altar as trophies of divine grace and ask, Lord, that you will do for them what they have failed and cannot do in a thousand years for themselves. Transform lives. Transform hearts. New vision, new perspective. And may we, like Nicodemus, be able now to see the kingdom and be able to enter into it. Guide us into this new experience, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. thank Evangelist Clark for the message tonight. Amen. Amen. And uh, for helping us to understand even better that which constitute the new birth and uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism by water. Tonight there are some who have made that decision and at this time, we are going to be having the examination of the candidates. One person was baptized this morning, and truly, we are very happy to welcome her into the fellowship of the saints, my sister. Those who are for baptism, I'm going to ask you to come forward. All I can see is smiles on their faces. Very, very happy about it. All right? No, just stand on on the... No, stand, 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 stand on there. Okay? Turn your face around so the brethren can see you. All right? Some look happy. Some look not so happy, but hello. Baptism in the name of Jesus is something to be happy about. All right? And uh, the fact that you're young just means that you are giving your whole life to Jesus. 
There are those of us who are very old. We are given the what left. But these are given their lives because their lives are before them to be used in the service and ministry of Jesus. Tonight, we are going to ask you to turn back around to me. And we're going to ask you some questions, um, just three questions. And we're using the alternate vowels tonight. And if you agree, I want you to hold up your hand. And when you hold up your hand, you're saying, yes, I agree. That's what you're saying. All right, so those people who are on the congregation will see when you hold up your hands. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Oh. And this is, this is not Nicodemus. Not coming by night at all. But she's come. The question, very simple. Do you accept Jesus as your personal savior and Lord? And do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with him? Number two, do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge by God's grace to live your life in harmony with these teachings? I suspect that you're not completely sure about that one, but you put your hand up. Because not even those who are baptized already know all the 28 fundamentals. Do you desire and this one is important. All of them are, but this one is very important. Do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your belief in Jesus to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you plan to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward of your personal influence, tithe and offering, and in a life of service? Do you desire to be baptized, expressing publicly that you love Jesus? Raise your hand. Brethren, you have seen the indications from these candidates. Is there a motion that we accept these persons subject to their baptism as members of God's church? I want you to turn around and look now. Candidates for baptism, turn around. It's, it's a motion, who wants you to know? Everybody can make motion. It's only one we need for the motion. Our brother Chris, make the motion. It's so move. Are there any seconds? All right, we're full up with seconds. Those in favor, show by raising your right hand. You see them? You see? Look around. You see everybody? All right, put your hands down. Those who oppose, by the same sign. Hello, look again. You see anybody, all of their hand? So they all accept you, even as Jesus accepted you before that. We're going to, at this time, pray for these candidates as they take their stand. Let us pray. Our eternal Father and our God, you who have declared that the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, you have spoken to the hearts of these five candidates, and you have bid them to come unto you as they labor, because you will give them rest. Night after night they have heard your words, and many of them have studied before, and there have been encouragement all along the way. And tonight they have made a decision to follow you through baptism. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will give them also the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Help that the new birth 
will take place in their lives so that truly they will know that Jesus lives in them. Truly, as the song says, live out thy life within me. O Jesus, King of kings, may this be their experience tonight and onwards. And may those of us who watch, those of us who have made our commitment, may we, as we view this baptism again, may we renew our commitment to be continuously transformed by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit and live lives that are consecrated to you and committed to you. Father God, we pray that you will be with them. Hold them in the all of your hand. Help, O oh Father, that Satan will not have dominion over them, but that the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against them when he comes in, and they will be able to claim the victory in Jesus' precious name. Hear and bless us now, we pray, as we go through the symbol of repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We're going to ask the deacons and deaconesses assigned to um, lead and direct in this as we ask our praise team to come forward and lead us into singing. One, two, one, two.
Jesus, I surrender. In the water, we have Jordan Rajay Hines. Amen. Amen. He has decided to give his heart to Jesus, right? Amen. Yes. And he's very happy about it. Just wants him shaking his head. And so, Jordan, because of your belief. is a little bigger little one but he too has decided that he wants to give his heart to Jesus his name is O'Neill Duncan and he is very happy to do this and so O'Neill because of your belief in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord we now baptize you in the name of the Father in the name of the Son and in the name of the sweet Holy Spirit, let the church A big name for a little girl, but she's going to grow into it. But more importantly, she's just begun to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She has decided to give her heart to Jesus. And as a token of this, she is in the pool waiting for her baptism. And so... Cassandra, because of your belief in Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the sweet Holy Spirit. And let the church say, praise the Lord. How sweet to hold a newborn name. My niece and the lady before was my grandniece but just before she goes on there Sasha is gonna sing one verse of a song for her there will please just listen to the words and not in my voice please sing it sister sing it there will be mountains that you'll have to climb and there will be battles that you'll have to fight the victory or defeat who to decide but how could you expect to win if you never try so you just can't give up now you come too far from where you started from. Nobody told you that the road would be easy and you don't believe he brought you this far to leave you. Amen, amen. 
Julian has made that decision to follow Jesus all the way. And as a token of this, she's in the pool waiting for her baptism. Julian, upon the profession of your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let the church say amen. 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 Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that would not satisfy. joy. How beautiful it is to see someone committing themselves to the Lord Jesus. I want to tell you as we close this series that there are others out there. Others out there. And I am here to assure you that your time is coming. That this is not our last baptism. This is only the final one for the series. And you who are here, not yet baptized, or maybe you're a backslider, and you want to come to the Lord, we want to assure you that we are having other baptisms coming up. And we have lessons. We will be studying with you and praying for you. I'm going to leave you tonight with one last word of prayer. I'm going to invite, please stand, brethren, and come to the altar. I'm going to invite everyone here, those who are not yet baptized, to come for your final prayer so that you will be in the next baptism. Those who are baptized by water, but you need to be baptized by the Spirit. I want you to come to the altar too, and I'm going to pray for you. I'll call you for one last final prayer for the series. And we want everybody to be included in this prayer. Pastor, I need special prayer for my family. Just raise your hand. And if you need special prayer for yourself, raise your hand too. I'm going to give one final word of prayer, bringing you to the throne of grace. Father and our God, we thank you for these two weeks spent in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the week of prayer with its awesome messages and the touching appeal. We thank you for the one week preacher done. We thank you, Lord, for those who come here night after night and listen intently to your word. We thank you for those who listen over the internet and other places. We ask, Lord, that as we come tonight, that in the name of Jesus, 
that you will do for us, Lord, what only our God can do. We come tonight, Lord, because we recognize that we still stand in need of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We ask tonight, Lord, that the baptism of fire will move through this audience from person to person. Every one of us who stand in need of spiritual transformation and renewal, we ask that the blood of Jesus Christ will prevail. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon our children and our relatives, our friends, our families, our neighbors. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you, Lord, will reveal yourself to us individually and personally. We ask, Lord, that a revival will break out in our hearts, a transformation in the way we look at our Lord, in the way we read the scripture. We ask, Lord, that tonight will mark the beginning of a new day dawning here at Kitson Town, Assembly Adventist Church. I pray, Lord, for every sinner coming to this altar, every unconverted person not yet baptized, but come to this altar tonight, recognizing that they stand in need of the baptism. I ask, Lord, that you will bind the satanic spirits that come against your people. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke every evil thought and satanic insinuation that will prevent us from surrendering all to Jesus. We ask tonight, Lord, that you will give us spiritual healing as you give us spiritual, physical healing. Heal our minds, our bodies, and our soul. And help us, Lord, that this day will mark the beginning of a brand new experience and walk with our God. And as we go, we ask, Lord, that you will give us journeying mercies. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. Good night, I ladies and gentlemen. May God be with you as you go. As we go, I want to thank everyone that came out each and every night of this our wonderful words of life crusade and don't be daunted that tonight might be the last night we continue on wednesday night so we expect to see you out in your numbers for prayer and praise that's wednesday night prayer and praise session so come out in your numbers